Hi, just a quick follow-up video to my previous one where we saw this uh, RD Tech DPS 5020 module uh, have the magic smoke escape from it and I'll link that one in here uh, at the end of the video and also down below um, if you haven't checked that out. So I thought we'd do a quick follow-up actually getting this thing up and running again because I didn't have time last time. Let's get to it. Now as you saw in the uh, previous video, the problem was that uh, there was a multi-layer ceramic uh, capacitor, 100 nanofarad uh, one, connected directly across the uh, pins on this, uh, well the two uh, screw terminals on the uh, backside of the board here. And uh, Glenn, who uh, is the designer at RD Tech, um, said yes, this was the problem, uh, actually screwing the terminals on the top of the board actually cause mechanical stress and cracking inside the multi-layer ceramic uh, capacitor when you turn those screws too tightly because that force of those even though they're rigidly soldered to the PCB is just enough that a tiny bit of you know like torsional type force is applied to the uh, capacitor which is directly of course rigidly soldered between the two pins and then it, you can get possibly a little micro crack inside and that can lead to the failure mode of these things which is typically a short circuit and of course all the energy which was delivered into that uh, capacitor via this grunty little uh, power supply caused it to catch a light and burn all aboard. Whoops. So yes, the follow-up to that is that uh, Glenn has admitted that's a problem and uh, has stopped selling these until he can uh, fix or actually redesigning the board to uh, have less stress on there. So if you do have one of these, um, he says just remove the capacitor. Uh, it's not hugely needed, it's just some like little extra filtering on the output. So that was a huge oopsie. So as I mentioned in the previous video, um, just be careful of mechanical torsion force on multi-layer ceramic capacitors and also thermal as well. Having the capacitor directly across and soldered to these two pins that have to be hand soldered, not a good idea at all. Uh, thermal stress can also lead to similar sort of problems uh, uh, causing a short failure. Now, when I repowered it in the uh, previous video, you saw that it uh, hiccuped and turned off, and that was a combination of two things. Uh, one is that I was using an external uh, current limited power supply, which was going into uh, limiting and then causing the thing to hiccup. And the reason that it was uh, overloading with no output um, on it was that the uh, uh, the board that's being carbonized in here actually ha uh, formed a low impedance so it's actually conducting across the output and that was what was drawing the, uh, the quiescent current and uh, causing the thing to trip. Now I did actually measure this before I uh, powered it up in the video you didn't see that and it was the in the order of you know tens of K or something like that but it's now 47 ohms for example and this will most likely change with uh, uh, the applied voltage as well so um, yeah it's like it's physically changed but anyway um, you can't if we swap the leads around there we go it's the same either way so we do have a low impedance directly across there so what we have to do is get in there with a dremel and or a knife and just uh, gouge out all of that carbonized uh, uh, fiberglass in there so why it actually uh, changed from when I originally measured it before I powered it up uh, to now where it's like 47 ohms or whatnot, it could be different if I power it up again. Um, I, I don't know, there's some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of chemistry thing happening in there with the, with the carbon based, uh, you know, burnt fiberglass or whatever. I won't pretend to uh, try and explain it. All I know is that we have to get rid of that, grind it out and hopefully this thing will repower up. Now unfortunately it's not as simple as just like grinding out a uh, track like cutting a slot into that because if you have a look at the top there's actually uh, two fuses down in there and also like the trace going over to there like I could do it but I'd rather try and keep those intact um, and those fuses they're 220 amp fuses by the way and yes they are intact uh, they didn't blow at all. And after gouging out a decent part of that, let's measure it again and bingo, you can see it's changed. So you can see that the more material that we're going to remove from there, well, the more resistance that we're, well, low resistance, um, short that we're actually taking out. So if you physically remove all of it, um, we should remove the output short. Unfortunately, we're going to have to gouge out a few things. All right, let's take a look at this. I've gouged out... Uh some of it in here but as you can see it goes all the way 
practically all the way through the board. Um, and if we flip it over onto the top side here, you can see down in there that under this uh, 20 amp fuse, yeah, the burn has gone all the way through the board. Uh, the top 20 amp fuse there is fine, but yeah, that's just a complete fail. So we can't just uh, scrape out, gouge out, uh, like half the depth of the board. We really have to route out the whole blinking lot between here, which is a real shame. I could probably maybe get the grinding wheel in there. And if you have a look, you can see that there's uh, these two, two, two 20 amp fuses aren't in series. Um, one's actually coming from some vias down in there over to here, over to the positive pin, and the other one's also come in from the positive pin, from the output of the inductor. And if you flip it over here, you can actually see what's happening there. So this one goes straight in, down those vias, through uh, that 20 amp fuse, and then into the positive uh, jack here. And then the other one is, of course, on the uh, top side, coming from the exact same uh, pins of the inductor. So they're effectively two separate 20 amp fuses going from the output of the inductor in parallel to the output pin. So why they've put uh, two 20 amps in parallel in there, um, my guess would be that maybe 20 amp is the most that they could get in an SMD size and they didn't want all the current going through one because this is a 20 amp output rated power supply so they didn't want to use a 20 amp rated uh, fuse in there in SMD size so they went, I hey, put two in and yeah, it's overrated. Um, so I wouldn't have, I would have put maybe two 15 amps in parallel or something like that in that particular case, because it's going to be much harder to actually blow uh, both of those um, 20 amps um, as opposed to like you know two 15 amps in parallel or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that's the best choice. But of course you can't use a single uh, 20 amp one for a 20 amp rated supply because eventually, in theory, a 20 amp fuse will blow. Of course, they they don't just magically blow at 20 amps. There is a characteristic uh, curve for all uh, fuses like this and it's all to do with uh, temperature rise inside the fuse, melting the internal uh, wire and how long that takes, the fusing time and all that sort of jazz which I won't go into but anyway there's two 20 amp fuses there so either I can get down the side and dremel it maybe um, like right down here or I just grind out the whole blinker lot but then I have to wire the fuses in separately and that's a real pain in the butt so don't know if I like doing that maybe the grinding wheel is the best option And there we go, that uh, seems to have worked a, a treat where like the, uh, you probably can't see it very well, but the internal charring on that board basically uh, stops there. So we scored away most of that. I'm going to have to repair, the, oh, that track is still intact, the copper's still there. Um, but yeah, I'll just uh, wick away that uh, solder on there. Of course we have to repair these uh, sense lines here. There's one on the top and... Let's have a look. Well, one on the top here and one on the bottom on the other side, but we've basically still got that fuse intact, all the vias, everything coming through. Um, and that, I think, should work a treat. Let's go measure it. Anyway, that saved dicking around with having to uh, re manually rewire those fuses. That would have been a pain, so that should do it. All right, so let's try it again. You saw that we were getting 47 ohms and then up to 70 or whatever. So I expect to see uh, uh, like some sort of uh, capacitive output charging or something. Hello, there we go. Started out low, of course, and it's, uh, yep, it's gone up. That's what I expect. Put it around the other way and woo, there we go. Started out low because there's some output capacitance somewhere that's charged and Bob's your uncle, look at that. All right, that's where I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, but hey, I deem that to be um, as normal as it possibly could be. So let's 
put it back together and power it up. Oh, and by the way, for those who uh, spotted it and pointed out, thank you very much. Um, the short across the pins on the microcontroller in there, that was uh, just a solder dag that got in there from part of my soldering or whatnot. It fell off, not sure how, but that did not cause the issue at all. It's gone now, and because that's only on the uh, keyboard uh, display side of thing, had nothing to do with the rest of the circuitry. Right, so if we actually uh, power this thing on and got it powered from a uh, 40 volt source with a 5 amp current limit uh, this time, uh, so it's capable of 200 watts, and you can see that it's drawing uh, 2 watts quiescent current, and you'll see that everything is just hunky dory. Now let's switch it, it's uh, got set to 4.9 volts, whatever, let's switch the output on. Um, it's not drawing, it's not measuring anything at the moment. Let's there you go, bingo, 4.97, it's reading precisely what it's uh, set to, and there's no current draw on the output, because this thing, you've got to assume that it's still working, because the fuses were intact, it's got all sorts of protections built in, so no worries whatsoever, it just flamed at that capacitor on the output, and the magic uh, smoke escaped, so it should still be a fully working power supply, and it looks like it is, so let's uh, switch on the load now and see what we get. All right, so let's set it to a uh, 10 watt constant current load. I've set it to uh, 10 volts precisely on the output. Um, in fact, let's uh, switch that on now. There we go. No worries at all. It matches and uh, 2 amp current limit. So that's 20 watts. No worries whatsoever. So let's switch the output on and see. Bingo. 9.8 watts is and it's a little bit out, but it's uh, I think it's like half a percent or something is the spec on this thing So no worries whatsoever 10 watts fine and dandy one thing I don't like and you can probably hear is the fan in this thing I don't have the top on it, but it is just whirring at constant speed even with no load. It's just Really annoying and it's loud enough to be quite annoying, but you know you could retrofit any uh, fan you wanted to Okay, now we're drawing a hundred watts. There we go, and everything's hunky-dory. Don't worry about the uh, voltage loss in here. I haven't set up uh, remote sensing, so we're just getting some loss across the uh, cables here, even though they are a decent size. When you're talking 10 amps, yeah, you're going to get some drop. Let's just have a look at the uh, output noise here. Like 10 volts, there's no load on there whatsoever, and uh, that's actually quite substantial. I mean, that output cap shouldn't make it like the the not point missing 0.1 uh mic on there shouldn't make a huge difference and if you're wondering where these uh spikes are coming from you can see those there if i capture it look at those um they like are still there even if i switch the output off i've got no load at the moment so that's a uh, that's the low no low no load noise and if i switch the output off as in like soft button on the uh, front of it, we still get that high frequency stuff. So that is coming from somewhere in the system. And that's actually coming from my environment here. So uh, yeah, I've actually switched off the input, the power supply. You can probably hear there's no fan noise now and it's completely uh, switched off. So yeah, we're just picking up crap because I've just got the leads flapping around in the breeze here. Meh. Ignore the man behind the curtain. And if you're wondering if that uh, no load ripple is caused by the lack of the uh, capacitor on the output, the answer is no. I can whack in a uh, 22 mic uh, 200 volt cap here. Let me make sure I got it around the right way. And I can put that directly on again. We've got no load and bingo, it makes no difference whatsoever. So that uh, measly, I think it's a 0.1 uh, microfarad cap across the output. It's just for, uh, you know, EMC, like, you know, CE compliance. So, and I believe this thing is, uh, uh, you know, CE uh, compliance. So not having that cap on there actually technically changes the uh, compliance of this thing. But uh, yeah, even a, a, you know, a 22 mic cap on the output, doesn't fix that, but you might see it change if you put a load on. So we can actually do that. I've got a uh, 100 watt load on the output. Let's put the cap on 22 microfarads. Bingo, you can see it, that's off, that's on. So you can see that uh, change just a tad. 
So there you have it, that's the uh, repair of the DPS 5020 power supply that completely smoked and uh, you know, thumbs up to RD Tech, they did actually admit it was a problem and they'd actually seen it before as well, in one or two uh, cases before, so they should have fixed it at the time, but they didn't, they sent me one, um, and a classic mechanical uh, and or thermal could have had uh, something that could have contributed as well, But and the most likely scenario is that when you screw in those screw terminals on the top, it just uh, got some micro cracks inside the uh, multi-layer ceramic capacitor, and in most of those circumstances, they will fail short, and then this thing is capable of, I mean, we're only 100 watts at the moment, but even that, like you dump 10 watts into that capacitor or something, and it's going to start smoking, and flames the magic smoke escapes and you get the flames and it starts burning but anyway it's robust enough to handle all that no worries whatsoever so sorry but i'm not going to fully characterize this thing in the video and do a full review of it and everything like that um glenn i believe it has actually stopped selling these um and until such time as they can change the pcb to do the layout uh properly and then they'll be reselling these with the uh corrected mlcc but i hope that's an interesting lesson to not only rd tech but to everyone out there that these multi-layer ceramic capacitors are susceptible as i said in the previous video to not only mechanical uh stresses which is a big thing for them thermal stresses uh they're susceptible to uh, just a failure in manufacturing you know you've got an infant mortality thing on these uh components so some will eventually fail and a good way to actually uh, reduce or eliminate, basically eliminate the problem is to put two of them in series. So if one happens to short due to whatever issue it is, um, then it, then the other one uh, will uh, still be a capacitor and yeah, you will uh, effectively double your capacitance, but it's generally not a huge issue. At least it won't smoke and catch on fire, especially for high power supplies like this that are capable of delivery, not, not just on the output of a supply, but as you saw on my uh, Ness uh, alarm system, which had the same smoking ceramic capacitor that caught a light and burnt the entire board. That was on, on the input side. So just like the AC plug pack, the rectified AC plug pack, um, if the capacitor was on there, just to, you know, filter it a little bit on the input side of the regulator after the bridge rectifier, and of course the plug pack can deliver watts and, you know, five or ten watts, and the capacitor shorted uh, due to, in this case, it wasn't a mechanical failure, it was just like an infant mortality uh, failure, uh, component manufacturing tolerance thing, it happens, and it caught a light as well. So not only just the output, but input side of things as well. So just be careful with multi-layer ceramic capacitors when you're laying out boards, take into account your location of the uh, ceramic capacitors next to any stress components. In this particular case here, we've got uh, screw terminals on the PCB. So when you put, you know, screw them up real tight, uh, the torsional force on there can uh, uh, couple through to the PCB. Or if you've got mounting holes or something like that, you're putting screws into those. You have uh, multi-layer ceramic caps next to those. Can you know? ruin your day. Uh, if you get a, generally, they'll fail short. If you're lucky, they might fail open and well, the product might fail, or you might get more noise or whatever. But when they fail short and you've got a supply across it that can deliver a certain amount of power that can make these things uh, catch a light. So anyway, it's a real interesting, real case of how component failure can, in this case, lead to something quite dangerous in a component catching on fire. Anyway, Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps a lot. And as always, discuss it down below. Catch you next time. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering why this video is maybe a little bit different, I actually, I'm shooting this thing on my uh, Sony Nex uh, VG30, which I normally only use for my uh, talking head mailbag. And I'm using the internal mic on that main air, which is a shotgun. So it may not be, audio may not be as, uh, well, it's probably going to be a little bit different to what you expected. Anyway, catch you next time.